Uh, I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, CEO of New America, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our event on the future of work uh, and specifically the five year anniversary uh, of the Shift Commission. So in 2017, with just, just over five years ago, New America partnered with Bloomberg Beta, led by Roy Bahat, uh, to, to convene a commission on the future of work, and we called it the Shift Commission. And from the beginning, we wanted it to be an uncommission. In other words, instead of identifying 15 or so experts on work and the future of work and meeting over a year or more and issuing a report, we decided to take it on the road and have, we really had almost uh, some 100 commissioners in many different cities. In each city, we had some folks who were the same uh, and then others we would bring in. Uh, and so it was a kind of rolling commission and you're gonna be in a number of those commissioners uh, to, uh, today, five years later. The commission uh, focused specifically on the future of work as viewed through the lens of workers uh, facing a very uncertain future and what they expected uh, and thought. I remember we interviewed truck drivers in Michigan who said automated trucks were at least 20 or 30 years uh, down the road. They may have been more right than we thought, but I still think it's not gonna be that long. Uh, the commission was led by Kristen Sharp, who ran a Future of Work project at New America then, and I hope she's listening. She was indispensable uh, to the process, uh, and uh, as well as Roy Bahat uh, and me. And uh, the, our commissioners came from business, technology, government, policy, academia, and from various professions. We then published a report uh, at the end of really almost a year of conversation and meetings across the country. Uh, and we summarized the research and identified four key insights uh, shaping the future of work, workers, and technology. That was the formal title, the Shift Commission on Work, Workers, and Technology. Uh, and I'm going to just run through those key insights before we then turn uh, to a set of interviews to see what we got right, what we got wrong, uh, and where we are today. So here are our four takeaways. Uh, the first point was that we really need to rethink uh, the, the role of employers in American society. Uh, you know, employers are how you got your health insurance, they have how you got your pension, there was a kind of a lifelong commitment, or at least a good long term uh, a commitment to stability. If that's no longer true, then what replaces that? And we looked at networks of small businesses, we looked at guilds, worker associations, uh, and also things like entrepreneurship training. And tried to imagine new ways uh, to administer worker benefits, which we are still definitely in the midst of. The second big point we came away with was that the future of work failed to align neatly with traditional political coalitions. The idea, you know, labor on the left, business on the right, no, it was much more complicated than that, particularly when you looked at the effects of technology. Uh, and really right now, as we look at chat GPT and the future of AI, we suddenly realize that actually many more white collar jobs may be automated before blue collar jobs. That's just one example of the ways in which uh, this did not actually track with where you might think political positions are. The third point, uh, one that I'm particularly fond of myself, is that we must focus on older workers. Uh, I'm somebody who's written a lot about if you take time out for children, maybe you don't stop working, but you work in a different way, uh, then you've still got a lot of career left at the other end. Uh, and we said, look, it's going to be very important uh, to engage those older workers as a very, uh, they, are, they were the fastest growing segment of the workforce. And finally, uh, the future of work will shape cities and regions. Now, we certainly did not imagine the pandemic, uh, but the pandemic and remote work, the very screens we are all now on, 
uh, have made this point ever more powerful, uh, that depending on what kinds of jobs you can attract, you can bring certain kinds uh, of workers, and it's going to be particularly important to be able to do this in non-coastal areas and smaller, uh, smaller towns. At the time, long distance moves were in decline. Uh, I think that is changing, but we can ask our commissioners that point. So those four big points uh, were, our, were our major findings in 2017, 2018. Uh, today, we are going to uh, be, as I said, asking some of our former commissioners where we are uh, now. Um, I just want to talk a little bit then about the, the, what's happened over those past five years. Uh, we, that, uh, those findings informed a lot of research uh, by Bloomberg Beta, by a number of our, our commissioners, uh, and by New America. Bridget Schulte and the Better Life Lab at New America uh, built off a set of extensive interviews, hours and, and subsequent ones, and surveys to dig into the questions of work and well-being. Uh, and Bridget is now writing a bo book on American Hiroshi. Hiroshi is the Japanese term for death by overwork. Uh, something that Japan may be known for, but we are not strangers to. Uh, and we also kicked off a partnership with the World Economic Forum. Uh, and indeed, I'm about to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Shailen Jotishi. Uh, so we're looking at how workplace technology can make jobs better rather than, than worse. Uh, so that is what came out uh, of our, our over, the, over the past three to four years. Uh, we decided that as the five-year anniversary came up that we wanted to take another look. Uh, and Roy Bahat uh, reached out and suggested that we do this event. Uh, and with his help, we have organized it. Uh, and indeed, we are very grateful uh, to Bloomberg Beta uh, for their initial support and for, for working with us now. Unfortunately, Roy could not make it due to a family uh, emergency, and he's very sorry not to be here, uh, and we are very sorry not to have him, but we wanted to go ahead. So I'm going to turn now to a video uh, from Roy, and then I will introduce Shailen Jotishi, uh, who will kick us off with our first interview. Hi, everyone. I wish I were there with all of you today. Uh, and it turns out that even for those of us who really specialize in understanding work, we struggle with the boundaries of life and work. And a good friend uh, has left us, and I'm choosing today to be in my grief and with our friends and our family. Uh, I do want to share some thoughts about the Shift Commission, because when we did it, we were uh, wise enough to know that predicting the future was a fool's errand. And we saw how the future of work with all the crises it could bring and all the hopes was already here, even then. What we wanted was to imagine possibilities for what could happen so that we could anticipate and prepare to respond. And, you know, reality did turn out to be more unimaginable than we thought. So I want to share a couple of thoughts on what's different than I expected and a reflection on where we go from here. So what's different, of course, the pandemic uh, with the, um, the pressure it put to change work, to make work immediately remote where possible, to change the geography of where people lived. You'll hear from Jed and from others today about that. That was completely unexpected. Uh, the other thing that was completely unexpected was that artificial intelligence, which was the technology on which we focused, would be just as potentially impactful for people who do work like the work that all of us do as it would be for truck drivers who we sat down with, for cashiers who we thought about, and others. And then the last thing is that we didn't anticipate that organized labor, which we thought of as an important historical force, would become as fresh and as relevant and it's, as it's become. And even though we had many voices from organized labor, including iGen, who's here today involved, we still couldn't have anticipated what this moment would be like. And a lesson I get from that is that transformation can be unimaginable, even while you're going through it. And to me, the 
call from that is a call for paying close attention. It's a call for noticing. It's a call for listening. Something that I think we set a really healthy foundation for with Shift. And even though you'll be hearing today from some elite voices, ultimately the answers really lie with the people who are most affected. And one consequence of the inequality in our society is that many of us are insulated and it makes it hard to imagine what those who are affected are going through. Even, you know, let alone the life of somebody who is struggling socioeconomically, but even the life of the illustrator who's worried about the next AI model that might take their job or one of us trying to figure out what tools to use. And so Rachel Korberg and I from the Families and Workers Fund wrote a piece about how the voices of workers are the ones that if we center, will have the most wisdom. And what I see continuing from the shift commission work is that many of us are just as vigorously engaged, if not more so in bigger jobs. I personally still have more questions than answers and am focused on trying to support new and emerging forms of organized labor while our firm continues to invest actively in AI and in tools that support workers. And I wanna thank New America and Anne-Marie and her team, Mary Alice, Shaolin, everybody, and all the original commissioners of the Shift Commission, our planning group that plotted the format, our steering group that gave us guidance on the content, all of our guests here today, and all of you uh, who are watching, you're all part of the quest that we have for answers. All right. Uh, Roy and I did not actually plan that out, but we picked out many of the same same points. So I'm going to turn it over to Shailen Jotishi. Uh, Shailen is a senior policy analyst with the Center for Education and Labor at New America, call it SELNA, which is led by Mary Alice McCarthy. And Shailen has been working on this project with the World Economic Forum on how technology can improve work. So I hand it off to Shailen, who's going to interview Derek Thompson. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, I too am very sorry that Rory can't join us, but I will do my best to fill, fill his uh, uh, big shoes. Our first speaker is uh, Derek Thompson, who's a staff writer at The Atlantic, where he publishes the newsletter Work in Progress on science, tech, and culture. Derek is the founder and host of the popular news podcast, Plain English with Derek Thompson. A news analyst with NPR, Derek appears weekly on national news here and now, and is a contributor to CBS News as well. His first book, Hitmakers, was named Book of the Year by the American Marketing Association, and his next book is actually coming out April 4th, so we all have some exciting reading ahead of us uh, in the months to come. So, Derek, thank you so much for being here with us. It's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, the book is not coming out April 4th. It's actually coming out next year, and it doesn't have a publication date, so you should, of course, be entirely thrilled to read it, but um, just hold on to that thrill for another uh, 12 months or so. Thank you for the correction, Derek. I had my, my years mixed up. Um, so speaking of which, Derek, so you were involved with the Shift Commission as a commissioner yourself, and, you know, it's clear that, you um, five years past, the public is still interested in, in coverage of the changing world of work. A lot of your writing at The Atlantic and other venues. What have we learned from the pandemic that journalists and other sources should carry with them in the future as they cover the future of work? Well, uh, I'll, I'll echo Roy that predicting the future is very, very hard. I don't think anyone at the commission predicted that a global pandemic was going to thrust us into a work from home experiment, which we would then have to reanimate in our reconsideration of the commission as we are currently doing on a Zoom webinar. Uh, so there are certain aspects of the future that were very hard to predict. I would also say that there were certain aspects of the future um, where we thought that some people, I think, thought that the future would come a little bit faster than it did because the last mile problem would be solved faster. So for example, I remember the conversation around self-driving cars in like 2014, 2015, 2016 was always that self-driving cars were a matter of months, maybe years away. Now we're in 2023 and the cars are not driving themselves, at least around my neighborhood in Washington, D.C. I think they're not driving themselves in just about every neighborhood except for a few that Waymo is experimenting with in Arizona. So I think that, you know, there's it's it's important, I think, when we get really excited about a technology. And this is true for ChatGPT as well. It's true for generative A.I., 
to think, okay, don't go so far anticipating how that last mile problem is going to be solved. Sometimes it takes a lot more compute or a lot more genius, a lot more something, breakthrough intelligence, um, to take something that's 95% complete and make it truly 100% complete. So one of the things that I guess I think about uh, lastly, uh, most is when I mean, you look at the, the work from home phenomenon or the remote work phenomenon, especially in a city like Washington, D.C., which I believe where I live and I think has the highest rate of uh, remote workers in the country. It's just amazing how many different things this touches. It changes how we work. It changes how we talk. It changes where people live. There's been a lot of research on how uh, there's been a donut effect, people leaving downtown areas, moving out into suburbs. And then I think goes to the fact that technology, these kind of technologies are, they're always like a, um, like a, like a cannonball drops in a water, like the ripple effects go very, very wide and it can be hard to predict exactly what they're going to be. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's been interesting to think about the, the ways in which technology hype cycles have been covered and how that affects uh, uh, public perception of, of tech and society. So really appreciate those uh, nuanced takes there. Well, Derek, I'll, I'll ask sort of the flip side of the question. So looking back to the Shift Commission conversation five years ago, um, what, what didn't you see coming that that we've experienced? You alluded to some of that with the pandemic, but were there other things maybe specific to how the media has interacted with, with the future of work uh, and how it shaped conversations in the media that um, you just really didn't see? Yeah, I do think that sometimes the media can get locked into one of two different archetypes. One archetype is the boosters and the other archetype is the Luddites. And again, these are archetypes. I'm not trying to describe every single journalist out there, but I think those are two archetypes that are easily locked into. And on the booster side, you know, one could say, well, you look at self-driving cars, you look at automated equipment and maybe fast food restaurants, you look at emerging technology right now like ChatGPT, and you get really, really excited about your predictions that it's going to replace work, it's going to replace illustrators, uh, it'll replace, I saw someone talking about how easily it was, how easy it was to do consulting work with Bing Chat. You could just, you know, if you're uh, consulting for an agriculture AI company, essentially say, hey, compare the um, consequences of, uh, of, of farming AI for the US versus China and it can create a beautiful table in 45 seconds for some consulting gigs. That's a week or several weeks of work. So you can get really excited about accelerating into a future that way. Um, and you want to always pull back and think, what's going to slow this down? On the other hand, on the Luddite side, I think there's a lot of people who have a kind of dispositional reflex to say that um, any prediction that technology is going to change our lives is stupid. They look at ChatGPT and they say, that's not real intelligence. That's just that's just a, a smart autocomplete. Um, or they look at, um, at self-driving cars and they say, that's not going to do anything. When in fact, self-driving technology is already changing the way that we drive. It's just not driving itself in a fully automated kind of way. Um, and so I try to plot a middle path there. Um, I would say that I think a lot of people would be shocked, not only from two years ago at the height of the pandemic, but also further back when we um, met with the commission, the unemployment rate right now is lower than any month since 1969. It's very difficult, at least, to look at that particular statistic and say, aha, there we see the displacing effects of technology. Now, the unemployment rate is, is, is lower than it's been in 60 years. That's, 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 an ex that's extraordinary. So I, I, think it's, I think it's always good to have a curious approach to the effects of technology on changing the way that we work, how we work, where we work, um, while also being humble about the fact that you know, systems are resilient, right? The labor force is resilient. Unemployment um, has not skyrocketed in the face um, of, of, of better AI and, and, and better certain forms of technology. It's, it's in fact very, very low. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Derek, I'm, I'm curious as, you know, we think about those two categories that the two archetypes that journalists in this space might fall into of floodites and boosters, do you have any advice or, or sort of encouragement for folks in the field to think about how uh, to help those in the media address the nuance and really get at um, the devil in the details that are there. Um, what, what comes to mind if you could wave a magic wand and encourage some support from the community that we've rallied behind this, this cause? Um, it's a great question. 
my, one of my answers might be might be something like, remember how interesting this is. I think the Luddite view comes from a kind of hope that new technology won't be interesting. That 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 don't don't be interested in this is sort of the subtext of a lot of writing about emerging technology. This is this isn't going to work. You shouldn't be curious about it. It's just a fraud. It's just a grift. It's just glorified autocomplete, et cetera. And on the other side, I guess there's something about you know accelerationist boosterism that is also not very interesting, right? This is going to change everything. Well, that's that's not particularly curious about what it's going to change. If you say it's going to change everything, then you're not curious about what it's going to change versus what systems are going to be resilient and change in response to technology. Um, so I, I would I would encourage everyone, and this isn't just for journalists, this is just for anyone sort of you know thinking their way through how technology, especially something is. Um, it's frankly wondrous is large language models and, and this new generative AI um, that we're starting to see today. Be curious, allow yourself to be curious, allow yourself to say, I don't know what the answer is here. I, I, I'll, I have lots of questions about what this is going to do to my job, what it'll do to an illustrator's job or a, a songwriter's job or someone who works at McKinsey's job. I have some interesting questions, but I don't have confidence conclusions. I think if you pursue uh, you know, your one's reporting through a lens of curiosity and and a sincere interest, I think that can keep you away from the the rocky shoals of of boosterism and, and Ludditism. Absolutely. Well, Derek, if it's one thing I've taken away from your writing, it's, it's solutions, but also uh, learning the right questions to ask. So really grateful for your insights uh, during the shift commission where I was, of course, an observer and, and now as we reflect. So thank you again for sharing your insights with us. And I am looking forward to your book when it does come out uh, yeah. in, in the next year. So thanks again, Derek. Um, awesome. And thank with you. that, Thanks, Derek. And with that, Henri, uh, back to you for our next interview with uh, Danielle Allen. It looks like you're on mute, Henri. Yeah, just waiting for Danielle to join us here. There she is. All right, we are we are doing this. Uh, in the very much the way we did the shift commission quickly and with lots of, of different folks. So uh, Danielle, hello, welcome. Nice to see uh, you. It's my, <laughs> it's my real pleasure uh, to introduce Danielle Allen, uh, who she has a very long formal title, the James Bryant Conant University Professor uh, at Harvard University. Uh, and she leads uh, the Safra Center on Ethics. Uh, really, the most important credential is she has just joined the New America Board, which I'm thrilled to announce. Uh, but also, she ran to be the Democratic candidate for governor in Massachusetts uh, in this most uh, most recent round. Uh, and so, Danielle, I'm going to start um, by asking you, as somebody who has long studied democracy and what strengthens democracy and, and civic engagement, what did you learn on the campaign trail about the future of work, how it affects what people are thinking, how prominent it was at that retail level of American politics? Because few of us really have, have seen that level of American politics. Sure, Henry, happy to. That's an important question. Let me just start though by thanking you for taking the time to revisit the commission report. Um, and you're right to sort of stop and take a look because things are changing so rapidly. I appreciated um, the comment earlier that one of the things that people weren't predicting was the return of union uh, unionization efforts, union power. And I've been out of the office I'm now sitting in for you know almost two years at this point. And I just came back for this. And lo and behold, I lent it to some graduate students while I was away. And so what is in here? I don't know if you can see this. It's um. <laughs> Picket, picket line, graduate students wow. unionizing at Harvard. I've got a whole box of t-shirts in here. So it turns out my office was being used for union organizing uh, while I was away. So uh, it is real, right? The sort of notion that we need empowerment in the workplace, that people who have been in precarious jobs need to reclaim their voices. I heard that certainly um, on the campaign trail as well. And um, there were lots of hotel workers on strike uh, while I was campaigning. There were nurses on strike while I was campaigning. And over and over again, they were making the same point. The corporations that we work for, for example, with the 
the nurse's case had literally made billions um, in the pandemic. And that wasn't being returned to wages for workers or the quality of jobs. So that inequity in the sort of basic structure of the economy was front and center in my experience campaigning. It seemed to me that the thing that we really need to focus on is a question of how to have the right uh, sort of structures for negotiation around creation of good jobs um, in times of great uncertainty. So the question isn't just about jobs, right? It's about the quality of the job. Um, and the quality of the job is of course about wages. Can you have a family sustaining um, compensation level? Um, but it's also about whether or not there are actually sort of pathways of advancement. Again, if you look at the healthcare industry, there's a sort of real challenge there. They're not being kind of scaffolded ways of moving up. And then lastly, there's a real question about time. We often talk about work-life balance, but I think we really need to talk about work-life civic balance. So at the end of the day, I think the goal is an empowering economy. That means to empower people in the fulsomeness of their lives, including as civic agents. So a lot of work to do, but but those are some of the conversations that I heard um, on the campaign trail. That that is uh, that's really interesting, and I love the concept of work life civic balance. That the idea that we actually need to make time for to be citizens, to be active participants uh, in our political system. Also, the the idea of what is a good job, I do think, is something we did not talk about enough, and we are all now thinking very hard about. New America just issued a report, uh, again, through the Better Life Lab, about how employers uh, can make jobs better. Uh, and it's not just about, you know, are you coming back to the office? Are you working remotely? It's a whole lot of things that make a job uh, fulfilling that give you a path, professional development, a lot of things that, frankly, when I started as a leader, certainly of, of a nonprofit organization, I would not have thought were part of uh, my obligation, management's obligation uh, to staff. It was mostly, you know, straight benefits and, and uh, salaries. So I, I also want to ask you about political realignment, because uh, as I said, one of the things we found even five years ago was this traditional Democrats are labor and Republicans are management uh, um, definitely wasn't working. How did you see th those issues? And were you trying to convince uh, dem uh, voters that might have been Republican once who were now Democrats or Democrats who had turned Republican? How, how did that cross cut uh, your experience? Well, I mean, I think you're right that we are in a moment where there is real realignment. I think about Wes Moore's campaign in Maryland, where he won, ran rather than and won on the platform of work, wages and wealth. That's a really yeah. interesting fusion of what had been Democratic and Republican paradigms in effect. Um, but that paradigm, it really mattered, particularly from the point of view of thinking about things like racial equity. You know, here in Massachusetts, we have the biggest black-white wealth gap in the country. And a lot of people have come to recognize that um, at the end of the day, if you're wanting to establish a sort of foundation for flourishing for individuals, for families, for communities, that is as much about building up assets over time. It's about wealth as well as about work and wages. So I think that has allowed for a lot of new um, sort of thinking about you know community wealth building, place based economies. Um, how do we think about even you know issues of property tax? How those are factoring into you know who's benefiting from tax systems and the like. Um, so there's a lot of innovation, um, and it's it's a good time politically in that regard because I think you can make real progress. Industrial policy would be another example um, where you know there's a democratic version and a republican version, but but basically in some sense both sides are sort of interested in industrial policy for the first time in a long time. Yes, I'm actually sitting in Europe at the moment, and we've been talking to to uh, members of the European Union who are none too thrilled about the Inflation Reduction Act and the Buy American provisions, right? right. I mean, it's, it is a new industrial policy for us. And, you know, we look at China and, and frankly, Europe and say other countries have been doing it, but it's yep. it, it, it it's not so long ago that we were, you know, the apostles of, of free trade and globalization uh, and in ways that, that, that have really changed. That's interesting. The wages work in wealth, and it. You also think about George Bush and the ownership economy. That was about mm -hmm. you know making sure everybody had a stake in the stock market. I think that's not uh, where we're going today so much as as you said, building wealth family by family and thinking about housing, thinking about narrowing exactly. the racial gap uh, in terms of being able to own a house uh, and community wealth building. 
So you mentioned racial equity, and that is definitely something we did not talk nearly enough about in 2017. I think the entire country, obviously through the pandemic, but specifically through the murder of George Floyd and the awareness, uh, of, at least in, among white Americans, of just how great that, that justice gap is in terms of physical violence, but also wealth. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that intersects with the union movement. New America has also been unionized since the Shift Commission. We have New America United. But one of the things we've seen, you know, unions were not good to African Americans. They weren't good to women either. But particularly, it was, it's not necessarily a way for to achieve good jobs uh, for people of color in this country. And do, does that changing? Do you is there something we need to do there when we think about new modes of labor or, so, or labor power? Well, that there is so much in that, Emery. You've given me so many different things I want to talk about. My to be hard selecting. Um, let me just start with the last point. Um, for sure, I mean, I think this is one of the most important messages there can be about unions in 2023. They've come a long way. Um, there has been a lot of diversification. There's a lot of commitment across an, any number of different unions to integrity, um, to tackling, for example, historical problems of or reputations for corruption. Now, I don't want to say that that change has been accomplished everywhere, um, but there has truly been meaningful change. The carpenters here in New England um, have done a great job. I sat with them and they had a lot to say about the way they were scheduling child care access for really early hours. If you're a construction worker, you're showing up at the job site at 5 a.m. If you're a woman, what are you doing for child care at 4 a.m. in the morning, literally? So they were thinking through questions like that. And you've got SEIU or Unite here, for example, um, also really diverse um, from a workforce point of view. And the most interesting thing about connecting in particular with those really diverse unions was how much democracy questions matter to them. So that was a place where they were registering a lack of voice and choice more broadly in the political system. Um, so there's a real interesting, I think, opportunity as well to think about the role of unions in helping us to renovate our democracy more broadly, make sure it's fully representative, fully responsive, um, and the like. That is great. So that's a, you know, practicing democracy. It's not going to be on the shop floor exactly, <laughs> where wherever you are. And the point of, about uh, as we we pour money into many communities for infrastructure that uh, there's a real shortage of the uh, of workers in those trades and mm -hmm. so to expand that workforce absolutely you want women you want uh, caregivers in general uh, you're going to have to start providing very different kinds of benefits uh, mm -hmm. as as a union and that's also a way of building up a much more holistic uh, sense uh, i think of of social needs well, those uh, let me give you just a chance to to say anything that I didn't ask you about that you particularly want to reflect on as you look forward both back to work five years ago, but maybe looking forward to five years from now. Well, let me just make one point about technology, since I know that that is also so important to this conversation. The worry about technology is about human replacing technologies it's really important to say that there is a completely different paradigm for technological development that's possible, which is about human complementing technologies, human complementing AI. Zoom is a great example. When we're able to see each other across a great distance in this fashion, that's not replacing any existing human capability. It's expanding and building on our human capabilities. And I do believe that if we could actually um, figure out how to steer technological development. Um, you know, we don't let, you know, drug development go unregulated, et cetera. If we could figure out how to steer and govern emerging technologies uh, in a more intentional way to be democracy supportive and to be empowering of the economy and of an empowering economy, I think there's a lot that we could do. And last point I'll make on that front too is, um, you know, we also have a problem Right, and this is particularly relates to uh, opportunities to address racial equity um, with the gap between the credential requirements for jobs and the credentials that are currently available in the credentialing system of our universities, colleges, community colleges, and the like. We have a lot of qualified, skilled, able, competent people out there who can't get jobs just because of that mismatch. And that's another place actually where technology could probably assist us in accelerating kind of micro-credentialing sort of landscape that gets people access points to job opportunities and then helps them have a pathway of like stackable credentials that they can move forward with. 
So I'll throw those two things out there for folks to chew on, things I hope will be bigger in the conversation five years from now. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Danielle Allen. I should have also mentioned Danielle's last book is Democracy, most recent, not last. <laughs> most recent book is uh, Democracy in the Time of COVID, uh, and I highly recommend it. And Danielle, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Emery. Great to be with you. Take good care. Always. Shailen, back to you. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. Uh, fantastic comments from Danielle and uh, the, the comments about uh, workplace technology being complementary to the human being is just the entire ethos of our partnership with the World Economic Forum. So uh, gosh, I found that so validating. Um, our next speaker is uh, none other than Jed Kolko, who is the Undersecretary for Economic Affairs in the Department of Commerce. So really excited to call Jed up and we'll... There he is. Great, wonderful. It's so great to have you with us, Jed. Uh, Jed was a shift commissioner, and uh, in his current position, uh, Jed coordinates economic analysis for the Commerce Department and provides the direction and oversight for the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and the Chief Economist in the Office of the Undersecretary for Economic Affairs, among many other distinguished roles. Jed was previously Chief Economist at Indeed and worked for uh, real estate company Trulia, among other great hats. So uh, Jed, we're so uh, uh, honored to have your perspective uh, with us today about the future of work and its influence and effect on the economy. So thank you very much for being with us. Great. Thank you for having me and thank you for convening this event. Uh, it's great to have uh, so many of us back together. Um, despite all the ways in which the world has changed, um, to have us back together talking about these issues again. Absolutely. And Jed, I think uh, Danielle's comments uh, teed us up really well for a conversation about the economy. Um, in Anne Marie's opening remarks, we, we referenced some of the key takeaways of the Shift Commission, in particular about the findings impact on older workers and on the rural urban divide. And we wanted to ask you, Jed, um, does that still hold up? Uh, how are these uh, uh, forces around older workers and the rural urban divide? driving your thinking today as a member of the Biden administration in the Department of Commerce. Would just love to hear your thoughts. Sure. So I think um, as we look back uh, over the past five years and think about uh, really at the highest levels, how we talk about the labor market and the future of work differently, um, the most striking uh, change to me is that so much of our conversation five years ago um, was about labor demand. Um, whether firms um, would need as many workers um, in the future um, as they did in the past, and what kinds of workers would firms need. Uh, and the you know, motivating questions, um, for the most part, were on the labor demand side. Um, but over the past five years, and especially with the pandemic, um, so many of the most important questions have switched to the labor supply side. Um, why aren't there more workers? What have been the reasons uh, that have held people back uh, from being able uh, to participate fully in the labor market. Uh, some of this, of course, during the pandemic uh, had to do with childcare and other caregiving needs, um, the inability um, in some roles to work um, uh, remotely um, and therefore having to face health risks. Um, and throughout all this period, um, we had uh, long-term trends like the aging of the population, um, uh, starting in about uh, after 2016, a significant decline in immigration, all of which uh, hurt um, the labor supply um, and uh, basically shifted the conversation about the labor market uh, from big questions about labor demand to big questions about labor supply. Um, and you know, whether that is you know, just about the pandemic um, and a sort of temporary shift, um, or whether this is uh, a you know somewhat of a permanent um, pivot, uh, you know, time will tell. Um, but I think this plays out, you know, both when we think uh, about older workers and some of the geographic questions. Um, one of the uh, things that we focused on um, with the Shift Commission uh, was how important older workers were, um, both uh, simply in the fact that the population and the workforce are aging, um, but also um, many of the trends. 
uh, that uh, we focused most on, such as uh, the rise of gig work and independent contracting and freelancing and other alternative work arrangements, uh, were in fact more prevalent among older workers um, than uh, younger and so-called prime age workers. What happened during the pandemic, of course, um, was that older workers were most at risk uh, from COVID itself. Um, older workers often also uh, took on many of the care burdens, particularly uh, in taking care of others um, who were sick from COVID. Um, and there were big shifts uh, in terms of how uh, people made decisions about retirement, entering retirement and coming back to the workforce. Um, and uh, in the end, um, the uh, most one of the most surprising trends um, coming out of the pandemic um, is that uh, for, for all the uh, discussion that we heard about early retirements during the pandemic, um, uh, workers age 55 to 64 um, are now, if anything, more likely to be working um, than they were prior to the pandemic. Um, unlike some younger age groups, um, that older group, uh, in fact, um, is uh, at, at least as likely to work as at any time uh, in many decades. Um, and so, um, if anything, that trend where older workers are going to make up more of the workforce um, only continued um, during the pandemic, um, though, of course, um, with some of the uh, increased need for flexibility and the appeal of remote work, um, that uh, is oh, as God. important to older workers um, as to others. Um, on the other uh, question you brought up, Shailen, on um, urban-rural and what's happened to geography, uh, of course, you know, the pandemic was not even uh, in terms of its effect uh, on places. Uh, and some of the hardest hit places during the pandemic uh, were both um, those particularly dependent on certain kinds of tourism, um, international tourism, and business travel, um, as well as uh, places where more people could work from home. Um, and therefore we saw the closure of lots of local service businesses, uh, particularly in downtowns and other office districts uh, that depended on people coming into the office. Um, and where we see even today um, shortfalls uh, in jobs uh, tend to be uh, in some of the central parts of the most expensive markets in the country um, where more people uh, can work from home, um, often outside of downtown. Um, and in some of the places, uh, particularly dependent on international and business travel. Um, and uh, the other um, uh, effect on geography though, is with the rise of remote work, um, it has sort of changed the way in which, you know, some locations um, are, are uh, suitable for employment. Um, and uh, with more people working from home uh, in certain sectors, of course, you know, nearly two thirds of us um, work uh, in occupations that cannot be done from home. Um, but for the roughly a third uh, who do work in occupations that can be done from home, um, it means um, uh, both uh, an increase in demand for uh, housing uh, as those people uh, have wanted to set up home offices permanently, um, a shift from spending on services downtown to spending on services like restaurants uh, closer to home, um, and uh, an ability to move farther out uh, from traditional downtowns if you're only commuting in once or twice a week instead of every day. Um, all of which, um, you know, in some ways may have been trends uh, that predated the pandemic uh, at a much slower pace, uh, but clearly uh, are ways in which the pandemic uh, is likely to end up having a permanent change. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was lots of kernels of, of wisdom and insights in, in your, your comments, Jed. And I, I'm curious if, if from, from your vantage point, looking at the economy uh, for the Biden administration and just given your, your prior experience, if, if you were to hold the shift commission today, um, what would be top of mind for you in terms of the economy and the questions that we should be asking ourselves? Um, so I think um, one critical question 
um, is thinking about uh, the relationship between workers and employers. Um, we are, you know, as, as I think Derek mentioned earlier, Derek and Dale mentioned, um, unemployment's at 3.4%. Um, that is the lowest in more than 50 years. Um, some of what we see today uh, in terms of uh, workplace dynamics um, is uh, dependent on uh, or, or arises from unemployment being very low. Um, and uh, tempting as it may be to point to trends in uh, worker power or the relationship between employees and their employers, um, one always has to keep in mind, like how would this look different if, if unemployment um, went to 6% or 7% uh, at some point in the future? Um, how much of what we think of as permanent new trends um, might unravel or look different? Um, one of the very striking things um, that we saw quite early in the pandemic but persisted um, was a big jump in the reservation wage uh, of workers, particularly those without a college degree. And the reservation wage um, is the uh, level uh, of salary um, that people would need to accept a new job. Um, that jumped, particularly for uh, workers without a college degree, um, early on in the pandemic, uh, and stayed high. Um, and you know that points to um, a really different set of expectations um, of what workers uh, need and expect from employers. Uh, and I think understanding that that jump um, and um, what that means for workplace dynamics uh, would be a, a critical question um, that you would be part of a sort of you know shift commission uh, revisited. Um, I think a second uh, would be around immigration um, and how much uh, of our workforce um, and the growth of our workforce uh, can come uh, through workforce development uh, domestically and, and what are the what are the kinds of uh, sectors or places um, that are particularly dependent uh, on the rate of immigration. Uh, immigration, of course, um, went down uh, after 2016, uh, was very low during the pandemic, uh, did increase last year. Um, there are certain sectors um, in the economy uh, that traditionally have been very reliant uh, on foreign born workers, um, some quite low wage, some quite high wage. Um, and um, given um, you know, some of the broader shifts uh, in terms of US uh, global relations and specifically around immigration, um, you know, some of these questions about, uh, again, labor supply uh, and where uh, some of the industries that the country wants to invest in um, will uh, develop its workforce, uh, I think would also be part of uh, a shift to mission discussion today, uh, even though that wasn't as big a part of the conversation five years ago. Yeah, no, absolutely. Gosh, uh, so so much in there. Um, and um, the immigration question came to mind for me as well when we were talking about the shift from a demand focus to a labor uh, supply focus in terms of labor, uh, certainly with CHIPS and Science Act and and the other infrastructure bills, uh, uh, that would be top of mind. Well, Jed, I'm curious, is there is there anything else that you would share with us as we reflect on the SHIFT Commission, either what has happened over the past five years or um, where you think the country really needs to pay mind as we shape a better future of work moving ahead? Um, I do wanna um, come back to childcare for a moment. Um, the uh, uh, gap in childcare uh, has long been different in the U.S. versus other countries. Um, the pandemic, uh, sh uh, the pandemic basically uh, showed uh, how big that gap was and how important it is. You know, when we look at um, uh, labor force participation rates, uh, we see that the gap really has grown between the U.S. and other countries uh, for women, particularly women um, who are of the age. Uh, to have sort of young and school age kids. Um, when we think about you know, the challenges around labor supply, um, both short-term worries around inflation uh, and 
uh, the tight labor market, as well as longer term concerns uh, around the aging population uh, and labor supply more generally. Um, Childcare, you know, it seems like uh, a clear um, uh, uh, policy uh, opportunity um, that, again, not a new issue in the US, um, but uh, really was thrown into relief um, during the pandemic. Um, I think the, the one other thing, um, uh, and this is uh, just a more abstract thought, um, one of the um, themes that came out of the Shift Commission's work, uh, particularly in talking um, to people um, in jobs where they had less control uh, over their uh, sort of time and structure, um, was how important stability was, the predictability of their hours, um, the consistency of income. And um, uh, five years ago, um, I thought about stability as something, you know, in some ways almost the opposite of flexibility, um, that you know, there were certain kinds of people that valued stability and other kinds of people that valued flexibility. Um, the pandemic sort of scrambled that for me. Um, uh, and I now you know, don't think of stability and flexibility as sort of opposites or different. Um, but rather, uh, you know, I now think of flexibility as something that gives people stability. Um, and uh, just thinking about how people, um, uh, both in you know high wage jobs that could be done remotely, um, as well as people in jobs that had to be in person, um, all value different kinds of flexibility um, during the pandemic um, and yearn for stability. Um, as our lives were upended, um, that you know, I, I no longer think of those as sort of different needs um, that sort of matter for different people, um, but rather, you know, is, is part of um, what people need um, from their work lives. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very relevant for the job quality movement and conversation that we've all been having, and including the good jobs principles that that Commerce put out uh, last year. Or so you know, that was fan fantastic insights, Jed. Thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, lots of lots of things for us to think about moving forward. Um, so we'll be moving on to our next speaker. Uh, again, a, a rapid set of interviews here. And I just wanted to send a reminder out to the folks in the audience. Please do uh, start submitting your questions to our uh, Slido chat. Uh, and you can engage with us on Twitter using hashtag revisiting the future of work. Uh, we're at New America and our Twitter handles for our speakers are also listed on our on our website. So uh, with that, Henri, uh, back to you. Thanks, Shailen. Uh, this is like tossing a ball back and forth virtually. <laughs> uh, so it's my pleasure to turn to our next interview with Ai-jen Pu. And before I, I introduce Ai-jen, I have to say, uh, Jed just essentially served it up <laughs> by pointing out, uh, talk, th sort of thinking about childcare workers and how critically important childcare workers are to caregiver pr uh, participation in the workforce. Still mostly women, but uh, you know, there. I think uh, our Better Life Lab has said there's some 73 percent of Americans who have some care obligation. That doesn't mean mean full time. Uh, so, I Jen was one of our original commissioners. Ijen is the uh, president of the National Domestic Workers Coalition and the founder of Caring Across Generations. Uh, I always introduce her as the person who really has put care on the political map. Uh, when, you know, 10 years ago, nobody was talking about care except for a handful of, of feminist economists uh, and Ijen, her book, uh, the Age of Dignity. When I didn't, when did it was published? 2014? 2015. 2015. Uh, her book, The Age of Dignity, talks about an infrastructure of care. Uh, those are all things that are now, you know, actively on the political agenda. We did not get Bill Back Better, that part of it, uh, but not for lack of trying. 
Uh, and we are also at a moment where, as Jed reminds us, we've got extremely low unemployment. We have tremendous care shortages, uh, but they have not translated into really great jobs for caregivers. <laughs> so I think that's fair, fair to say, although uh, really the National Domestic Workers Coalition has, has done a great deal and is doing a great deal to change that. Um, I, Jen, I want, I guess, the first thing, I'm just going to ask you a general question. I was sort of, as you think back to 2017, pre-pandemic, uh, and all the changes that have happened since, um, what are the, are the, are there things now that surprise you, uh, particularly in the care arena, in terms of the, the uh, quality of jobs for care workers, the unionization, uh, whatever it is you want to open us up with? Um, well, first of all, thanks so much for having us and for revisiting this conversation. And I must say that if you hadn't been one of the leaders of the Shift Commission, I'm not sure we would have been talking about CARE five years ago when we were. Um, you have been such an incredible guide holding the lantern for all of us to be able to see all the parts of the economy that we need to see. And so just thank you for your leadership. Um, and I will say that I have been surprised at the extent of progress we've been able to make in the last five years on care. I know it sounds like an optimistic stance given the depth of crisis that we're dealing with, but I, you know, what we're dealing with when it comes to care is just such deeply seated, deeply held cultural norms and beliefs that have been reinforced by policy, by media, by culture, and and all of a sudden in the pandemic, this deeply held belief that care is a personal responsibility, that if we cannot figure out how to afford care or manage it, it's a personal failure, right? That we don't have the right job or we didn't save enough or we didn't buy the right insurance or what have you. That was sort of the dominant point of view. And I think what the pandemic did was help us all collectively see that we can be doing everything in our power right and it's still not enough because care is a shared social responsibility and really at the heart and foundation of our economy. And so the patchwork programs and, um, and solutions that we had in place all of a sudden when the bottom dropped out, we realized just how essential they are and so we've been able to make a huge amount of progress. And I just want to name that we were able to pass through the House of Representatives a bill that included almost three quarters of a trillion dollars in investments in the care economy. And it would have been the single largest investment in the creation of good jobs that would directly benefit women and women of color in the history of the United States. So that passed. Now we came one United States Senator short <laughs> of having it become law. But to me, that is a sign of rising, that this issue is emerging as a top pol economic policy priority. And we heard it from the researcher at the, the Department of Commerce, right? Yes. This is not the women's agenda. This is the economic agenda. And to me, that is very hopeful. It's long overdue and I think a huge opening. I think that is the right way to see it. And when you think about how long, you know, major legislation takes, I mean, just think about Obamacare, you know, three presidents, four presidents trying to get it through. So you're right, it came, it came very close. And that would have been uh, unimaginable, certainly say in 2010 or, or 2015. So part of the, the the other thing that that we are seeing, thanks to in, in large part to your efforts, is the unionization of care workers. And I'd love to hear your take on where we are with that, uh, with the difference that it makes, and whether those the caregiving caregiver unions are in fact making care that kind of good job that we need, not just a job, because but a, a really good job. Well, I would say that we have a long way to go uh, to making these jobs good jobs, and they deserve to be. There is no read. These are jobs of the future. And as our friend Larry Katz often says, they're actually triple dignity jobs. 
because when you improve the dignity of these jobs and make them living wage jobs with benefits and real economic security, it not only benefits the worker and her family, but it also benefits the person who's being cared for and the family caregiver who's able to then work and participate in all sectors of the labor market because their loved ones are cared for. So this triple dignity impact of these jobs becoming good jobs, I just wanted to name. And I would say that the average care worker across the care economy, whether child care or home health care, for example, still earns less than $14 per hour. But where we've seen that go higher is through unionization. And I do believe that that has been the way it's organized groups of workers applying whatever power they can aggregate to pushing for more funding to be made available for these wages, to increase for training to be established. And I will say that Washington State, um, I've worked very closely with your team at New America to really tell the story of Washington State as a model because it is so extraordinary. Washington State has a home care training fund that trains more than 45,000 home care workers per year. It's the second largest educational institution in the state after the University of Washington. And the starting wages for a home care worker in Washington State are above $20 an hour. And everybody has health care and retirement benefits. Um, and, and there's an investment in the quality of care and the quality of jobs at equal value. And it has made Washington state one of the most prepared state for the growing demand um, for health, home health care in this country. And so it is, it is clear, it's been proven that unionization and the creation of good jobs works and it can be done. And, um, and so i I feel like it's one of these areas of policy where there's not a lot of mysteries. Like we actually know what can have an impact and and we should go for it. Yeah, um, it, it's really, it, it, it's, it also directly affects the quality of care in the ways that it reduces the stress on the caregiver. Uh, our early and elementary education program had a report now probably five or six years ago, but looking at child care workers who were making so little money that they were worried about their own health care, about being, you know, caring for their own children, just about paying the rent because it was paid so little. And of course, that translates, as we all know, as parents or taking care of anyone, if you're stressed, you know, you that that is is quickly uh, communicated through. So it, it, just that that degree of security has that impact. And I love the the triple dignity jobs. It's, it's a wonderful way to think about it. Um, I'd like to ask about how you think technology intersects with caregiving. And you said, you know, these are human jobs. These are jobs we will need even more of. But are there ways that that technology can make these better jobs? This is, again, something that Shailen is working on. Uh, absolutely. And um, and I just I forgot to mention the earlier example of Washington State is all SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, really just cutting edge work on care jobs. Um, and back to the, the technology point, I want to pick up where Danielle left off, which is to say that these jobs have been incredibly difficult, physically, emotionally, and otherwise. And I do believe there's a huge role for technology to complement the role that humans play um, in our care infrastructure and to make some of the rote tasks and the more physical tasks much, much more um, sustainable, frankly. I mean, if you've ever seen a Hoyer lift, it looks like something straight out of the Flintstones. Like I have no idea where technology has been to help home care workers in terms of some of the more physically challenging parts, which actually have the impact of freeing up those workers to provide some of the more human and emotionally um, intensive aspects of the work. And my colleague Pollock took a group of care workers through a whole learning series about technology and robotics and artificial intelligence. And 
the workers themselves were so clear, they were not at all threatened by um, robotics or artificial intelligence because they know the unique human value um, of their work, <laughs> that there is that that what they provide to the people that they care for is irreplaceable, right? At least now, <laughs> based off of what we know from the technology, and that if they could be freed up to focus there, it could be very powerful. It's like thinking about doctors if they had to spend less time, or anybody in the healthcare professions, less time filling out the forms, less time on all that work that 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 is, as you say, wrote needs to be done. Uh, but but to to allow them to spend more time actually asking patients, you know, about other things in their lives than than the immediate uh, presentation. So, Ajahn, thank you. I want to ask you one final question. If you were you were a commissioner uh, with us, and if you were setting up a shift commission today, uh, thinking particularly about care workers, but even more broadly, are there a, one or two specific questions you would ask now or want us to think about now as we look forward to the next five years? I've been thinking a lot about um, how we learn and how everything is mediated in ways that mm, um, are sometimes very positive and sometimes not so much. And I would um, think about it less in terms of the questions because I think you always ask the right questions, Emory. I think it's more about the method of learning. And I'm a Brian Stevenson fan, so I would say, how do we get commissioners and people in decision-making positions to be proximate and to spend a day with a home care worker, spend a day with a retail worker, um, and, and just really understand uh, what it is that we're talking about when we're talking about technology coming into these workplaces, what it is we're talking about with the challenges to unionization from a like on the ground, as proximate as possible standpoint. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, Jen Fu, thanks so much. Uh, and Shailen, back to you. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. And gosh, uh, so many kernels of wisdom there. I certainly have the bat signal up and uh, will be excited to learn about uh, the project that I just mentioned on care workers and tech. Well, we will be shifting gears as we reflect on the shift commission for our next segment on the future of work and technology. We will have two speakers. So I am so thrilled to uh, introduce uh, Bethany Drake Maples, who's a researcher at Stanford University and founder of Starsight AI. And joining Bethany is Pamela Mishkin, who's a researcher at OpenAI. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Thank you so much for having us. So excited to, to have a conversation with you all now to round up our, our event today, really sort of thinking about the future of work and all the technological advancements that have occurred over the past five years. Of course, chat GPT is top of mind uh, for all of us these days and has spurred just an entire uh, ocean of, of awareness and energy and concern and fear and hope and dreams around tech and the future of work. So, Bethany, Pamela, this question's for the both of you. You've been focused on AI since before the original Shift Commission uh, five years back. What surprised you most about AI in the last five years as experts in the field really on uh, sort of the front lines of research? Pamela, do you want to go? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think definitely uh, how much of the sort of pace of the pace of development, um, speed of development, um, specifically how much of it's been focused on uh, knowledge work as opposed to sort of um, really being able to automate uh, any sort of like physical labor, which a lot of I think the commission's report focused on. Um, I also think just even the last six weeks, um, the sort of jump the models have made and it's sort of binary jump between um, being sort of useful and actually usable. Uh, in so many different contexts. Um, so I think that both like highlights their promise to the economy and also risks to jobs and across like a number of different domains. Um, and also highlights the importance of other safety issues that we might want to think about, um, particularly ones that become most salient 
uh, as they're attached to work and as they're sort of attached to actually using the models in context or sort of increased dependence on the models. So things like bias and um, generation of hate speech, um, as well as just sort of uh, larger questions of dependence and um, the importance of maintaining a human in the loop to prevent over-reliance. So. Totally. I, I'm really like so happy about what I'd call like the intellectual diaspora, right? Like the, the fact that so many people are thinking about it, that policymakers might actually be using AI and like daily. And I just think that's going to be really good for just generally people understanding what's coming down the pipe. Um, and, you know, hopefully it, like with better policy creation. So, mm. Um, yeah, I, I, it's going to be a wild ride, um, but I'm really excited that so many people are thinking about it and using it like every day, which you just didn't have before. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, uh, Pamela, your, your comments about the focus on AI on knowledge work and less so the physical labor uh, rings for me, given iGen's comments about sort of the lack of attention on, on workplace tech. Uh, of helping care workers with um, with their jobs. And then Bethany, it's really interesting point thinking about how Hill staff and uh, other policymakers can now tap into AI to answer questions that, well, normally they might go to places like New America for. It's really sort of the changing <laughs> <laughs> the future of work for all. Um, so along those lines, uh, and this is of course to both of you again, if people want to understand how AI might change their work right now, do you have suggestions for them as, as experts in the field? Where should they be looking? What questions should they be asking? It's an interesting framing. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. I'll start out. Um, in general, you should just expect less noise in the system, right? You know, better matching of roles and careers, uh, maybe better matching of, you know, apprenticeship relationships, and hopefully better matching of like education, upscaling and reskilling opportunities. You should also expect that we'll be able to measure more things. And that's going to be like both good and bad, you know, um, workplace assessment, college entrance exams, you know, what we study for might fundamentally change and the mathematics behind that might fundamentally change. So yeah, again, some people will benefit from this and some people won't, but I, I really believe that we'll be able to come to like a really great outcome. And then ultimately just imagine your most like ideal human interaction and like expect more of that. If that's like a human tutor or a mentor who you really respect, who knows you very deeply or some sort of like intellectual counterpart, you know, what, what you, the best of what humans do is going to be more available for you personally. Yeah. Pamela, what do you think? Definitely. No, I think I agree with all of that. I really like what you said about sort of less noise in particular. And I think paying attention to sort of like the speed and pace of development, going and trying um, GPT-2, for instance, and seeing where this technology was just three years ago um, or four years ago, and then uh, sort of where it's come today by using ChatGPT. Um, I think that uh, yeah, I encourage sort of all individual workers to sort of form your own opinions and sort of use the models for yourself, see where they're useful, see where their limitations are, but also not get too bogged down into where the limitations are today. Um, really think about uh, how they'll, uh, how effective they'll be um, as they're sort of embedded in uh, more contextual systems, systems that sort of double check for some of the um, easy failure modes of the models, things like hallucinations um, and uh, uh, sort of like when your employer or your union sort of like asks for an opinion on this um, or sort of considers uh, putting it into the sort of workplace, uh, already sort of uh, having formed um, some expectations of where it will be useful and where it won't um, and really making it sort of work for you. Yeah. I mean, you know, we have to remember that like almost a billion people are already talking to chatbots like every single day, even before ChatGPT came on the market. Like Xiao Ice and, and Replica are these like agents that people use daily. And what we've seen is that people use them as intellectual mirrors, right? They use them for cognitive learning, for emotional scaffolding, as well as just for those kind of like mundane, like querying and like search things. So, you know, we're going to see some displacement of human relationships. We're going to see some stimulation of human relationships. And I do think it's kind of up to each individual and each organization to like help teach people how they think it might be best designed into their workflow and into their like social network. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I love the, the sort of framing that, that you all used about, um, you know, AI and work actually being maybe an opportunity for more of the human presence to become more visible. I think oftentimes, you know, we see narratives sort of citing 
Duran of Samoglu's work on so-so automation and, oh, we're all going to have more kiosk counters with no people behind them and, uh, you know, things like that. So um, it's, it's, it's good, I think, for us to surface the other side of that. Um, um, so my next question here is sort of thinking a little bit more about the application of AI to work specifically. Bethany, Pamela, What's what's on the horizon for us? What are we in for? Uh, how do you think AI will will change the nature of work in frontline roles in particular? Um, Pamela, thinking about more of those sort of physical uh, oriented jobs, maybe in retail, transportation, in these other industries. Definitely. Um, I think these are some of the jobs that might change the least, at least in the short um, to medium term. Um, as at least like the sort of evidence we see so far. Um, but I also think some of the ways that they might change those jobs is in kind of making them better. So if we think uh, about going from sort of more long haul trucking to short haul or like last mile trucking, um, that's a much better job. You can sort of stay close to your family. Um, you can sort of work shorter hours, mm -hmm. more predictable hours. Um, and that's so that I think if we can sort of figure out how to build those kinds of tools, that's um, an exciting development. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I generally, I think, we've seen this sort of pace development focus a lot more on the sort of cognitive work work that can be done at a computer. Um, and so uh, it means the sort of parts of those roles that are really focused on that human to human um, interaction might, uh, but the importance of those are, of that interaction is strengthened a lot, becomes rarer. Um, and uh, it, um, and there's might be, that you might sort of see growth and demand for that kind of job and role. Yeah. I'm I'm like super stoked by this <clears throat> possibility of like AI in the loop, you know, not necessarily any replacement, but actually being like, hey, you know, wh where are the places where a, a personalized agent could like really come and help you? And so that is like, you know, the obvious thing of like, okay, a tutor, you know, like, what does it mean for like that trucker if they can have a natural language conversation and like, you know, dialogue with an agent as they drive and they help them upskill and rescale literally as they drive? You know, or what does it mean for teachers and tutors to have an AI in the loop helping them manage the classroom, helping point out linguistic markers that might indicate somebody's shy or somebody's struggling and like how they could, you know, overcome, you know, maybe even their own biases um, around like who talks and like what what's next. So it, it's going to be a wild ride. Um, but I, I have a lot of hope for, you know, those people that, that think critically about designing AI in the loop. For sure, you'll have like some some companies that feel they need to go like 100% automation and that's like maybe their fiduciary duty because it sounds cheap but like I, I really think that like you know humans in the loop are going like to yield more value and that's just going to take a bit of like a designing tuning kind of moment or mechanism maybe that's a month maybe that's a couple years for each organization yeah no, i love that humans in the loop that's that's just a great great sort of uh slogan for a lot of these um for a lot of work in this space. Well, Bethany, Pamela, I have to ask you the uh, same question we've been asking our other uh, speakers. If we were to hold the SHIFT Commission today, what questions would we need to ask ourselves of tech and the future of work um, to make sure that we're, we're shaping a better future of work, that we're accomplishing some of these uh, ideals that we've been discussing so far? What, what comes to mind for the two of you? Emma, go for it. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, I think um, definitely, I think how we sort of, uh, I guess, I didn't decide to sort of be more proximate to the sort of jobs we're talking about. Um, I think sort of what were our sort of incorrect hypotheses about um, some of these roles five years ago that led to both misplaced investment in um, AI, um, sort of focusing more on self-driving cars as opposed to this kind of knowledge work that turned out was, you know, easier to automate in a lot of respects. Um, I think thinking through uh, how we sort of, uh, how you sort of maintain um, interest in building skills, how you sort of build intrinsic motivation to learn, because ultimately humans continuing to have new skills to um, manage or maintain or double check the work of an AI system is going to be really important. Um, but as the sort of promise of labor at the end of that learning goes away, it becomes much harder to sort of motivate um, and uh, dec like, uh, maintain sort of proper dependence and proper reliance on an AI system. Um, yeah, I think those, those two to start. Yeah, totally. I mean, I feel like equity and responsibility are, are, are really important, right? You know, we're, we're going to see more automation and, you know, if we don't want like a kind of, of, of minimum machines, Vonnegut like situation, you know, how do we, 
how do we bring humans along? How, you know, what's the responsibility of employers or policymakers? I don't think we figured it out. Um, you know, in, in such a decentralized system like America, I really don't think we figured it out. So I'd, I'd ask questions about that and get really smart people, you know, thinking about it now. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, oh, yeah. I think understanding what, uh, you know, so much of our uh, self-worth is tied to work today and um, understanding uh, how we actually sort of replicate that um, as that work changes or goes away um, and how we sort of make these transitions kind um, to workers, assuming they sort of will take place um, and maintain that kind of stability um, that it matters so much to people as the commission showed, uh, I think it's gonna be really important. Yep, absolutely. Gosh, I have so many more questions, but unfortunately, we're uh, running tight on time. So uh, I, I just thank you both for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Any final takeaway uh, thoughts, questions that you'd share with our audience here about the future of work and, and AI and tech? Sure. Um, you know, we kind of have the chance to reimagine the whole system, right? Like right now we are living with a lot of like industrial era, like legacy decisions um, that were based on kind of uh, compute, you know, poverty, resource poverty that we just don't experience right now. Um, you know, and we could just replicate like what we have, or we could think about like designing something that works slightly better for society. And yeah, the, you know, that sounds far-fetched and it might take coordination across multiple levels, but that's like what's really exciting about right now. Definitely. I think, um, you know, every job is likely going to change in the next sort of few years um, and uh, how we sort of maintain worker power in those decisions and in those discussions, um, how we sort of make sure that we're maintaining democratic values that might, uh, you know, shape how, like a participatory uh, methods of sort of building these systems, I think will be really important. Uh, I'm really excited about those efforts. Yeah. Absolutely. So much for us to, to think about and do as we move forward uh, in, in this future for work realm that we all live in. So Bethany, Pamela, thank you again so much for joining us. Really appreciated your insights. For our next segment, we will be turning to, to audience Q&A. Uh, so again, please feel free to put your questions in, in the Slido chat and we will be turning to them shortly. We're going to have our first uh, um, question come from our colleagues at Charter. Kevin Delaney is here with us. But before we turn to Kevin, we do have Roy Bahat coming in one more time with a video uh, to help close us out. So I will turn to my event colleagues to uh, pull up Roy's video, and then we will turn to Kevin to kick off our Q&A. I want to end by sharing one last thought, which is what this work meant to me. It gave me, in my own attempt to understand work, two forms of medicine that I still carry with me. The first is that instead of my usual habit, which is talking, trying to convince people of something and learning through debate, I, a little more often, find myself listening to learn especially listening uh, to those who are different from me, politically different, ideologically different, socioeconomically different, demographically different, whatever form of difference. And that desire to sit down across difference and make it a successful um, exchange is something that I learned through the Shift Commission just doesn't happen automatically, that we need to labor to create a container for it and struggle to figure out the circumstances. And that's something that I hope that we, and New America and all of you uh, will be doing for years to come. So thank you for joining us. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Roy, for sharing those comments with us. And to kick off, uh, we're really excited to have uh, Kevin Delaney from Charter with us uh, to uh, get us going. Uh, Charter is a fantastic resource for covering all things the future of work. I've learned so much, Kevin, from uh, your team's newsletter. Uh, there's so much wisdom in it. So certainly encourage uh, our, our colleagues in the audience to to join in. So um, Kevin, turning to you to help kick off our, our Q&A period uh, here, um, what, what, what questions do you have for us as we've reflected on yeah. the SHIFT Commission? John, thank you so much and uh, awesome discussion. I like the note from the last panel where we had Bethany and Pamela talking about the exciting possibilities, but the importance of maintaining worker power and democratic values as we navigate this. I sort of, it's one of the things that will stay with me. I want to go back to the beginning. I have a you know I have a question for you both, and it starts with where Anne Marie started this conversation and her takeaways of slide, the initial one, 
And her first bullet point, which was about the need to re-examine employers' central role in society. And we've seen this, particularly over the last few years, there really is, is not a lot of consistency in the expectations and in the practice of what employers provide. And you can think about areas like mental health. Employers, most employers didn't think of themselves as mental health uh, providers for the most part, but in fact, that's become a core part of how they're able to support their, uh, their employees. Childcare is an issue that's come up in almost every discussion today. It's another area where employers recognize that, that their, uh, their employees having access to good, affordable childcare is key to their success as businesses increasingly. So I, I think one of the issues, and this is my question to you, one of the issues is that they, we as a society haven't updated the expectations of what employers need to provide to their workforces. Where does the line between what society provides, what government provides, what unions and other, uh, other organizations provide and what employees provide? We've just sort of um, had this kind of uh, seep into a, a world where, where it's clear that there are these needs and these needs have intensified the last few years to support employees um, but what are what are realistic expectations? You know, again, another area uh, speaking up on societal issues such as voting rights and reproductive rights. Very few companies, probably ten years ago, would have thought of that as part of their own responsibilities. But it's clear that employees expect that of most employers these days. And then the so what is how do we completely move this conversation forward to have a common understanding and expectation of what employers should provide? And paired with that is how do, we, how do we make sure that the government and our shared communal responsibility for these areas are defined and fully realized as well? And again, childcare is, is an issue where it's clear training is another issue, where it's clear that the effort, efforts of individual employers are not probably capable of solving the problems at scale. So I'm gonna, that's my question for you. Expectations of uh, employers, it goes back to Anne-Marie's first point, um, how do we move this forward uh, in, in concrete ways? I'll take the first crack. And I spend a lot of time thinking about this question as the head of a nonprofit. And I, I honestly don't understand why American business, private sector, and not, as well as, as nonprofits, but private sector does, doesn't just rise up and demand universal health care and child care. I mean, the, the tax that if we compare what companies in other countries uh, you know, are able to do because there's universal health care or child care rather than having to pay that yourselves every year and it just goes up and up and up. Uh, it, it, it really, the, the politics of it do not make sense to me. I mean, I understand the insurance company's view, although even there, the system is so Byzantine. Uh, but I don't understand why corporate America is not demanding universal health care and care and infrastructure of care to level the playing field of competition with their foreign counterparts. So, so that's a starting point. Um, but the, the then so so let's say, you know, we we've got the politics and finally you know, people sort of see their self-interest. You know, it's we're not we we say this all the time. We're not going to be Scandinavia. We're not going to be France. I mean, you know, the United States has we've got the most really a, a kind of again a, a baroque or Byzantine system of healthcare and and a very patchy uh, system of other kinds of care. But as we overhaul it, it won't be government provided everything. It will not be huge institutions. So then I think, well. So it'll probably be a mix where I like the idea, you know, the original, the public, uh, the public option with childcare. I think the government can actually uh, provide a benefit. It provides a very good benefit in Medicare uh, that, you know, private companies or, or uh, sort of unions or associations have to meet. But I'm particularly interested in the kind of guild model. And we did look at this uh, at, at, in the Schiff Commission, and we looked at the Screen Actors Guild, uh, and there are others where you could imagine all nonprofit work workers or different 
kinds of nonprofit workers, because there are many different kinds of nonprofits, uh, coming together in such a way that, and this is enabled by technology, that they then have bargaining power with insurers, caregivers uh, of, of various kinds, so that it isn't up to one organization or one business, uh, but it's not government either. And to your, but your, the, what's really interesting in your question is, you know, where are those boundaries? Because yes, there's still going to be family care. There's still going to be lots of people who think who want, would prefer that. There should be some government. You do want employers thinking, you know, this is our responsibility to to help develop our workers and help enable them to work well, which is really the way way I think about it. I suspect that those boundaries will be drawn quite differently in different states and that we'll have a lot of experimentation, maybe at the municipal level, certainly at the state level, before we get to anything that looks like some kind of federal equilibrium. But Shailen, you're, you, you have a very different perspective or you come at these issues from a different place. So I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, gosh, uh, thank you, Anne-Marie, and, and thank you for the question, Kevin. I think that's really just the, 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 big, the big enchilada that we all need to be focused on is the role of employers in this. Well, you know, what comes to mind for me is sort of the permeation of the job quality movement in the employer space. Uh, last Davos, uh, Davos 2023, that is, the World Economic Forum released for the very first time a framework for job quality, the Good Work Framework, and subsequently launched the Good Work Alliance, a, a, a alliance of uh, major employers and smaller ones, too, that are committed to enacting a lot of the principles in the Good Work Framework. And that happened on one of the most premier uh, stages for uh, industry leaders and policymakers to come together and think about the economy. You know, Klaus Schwab talks about this in his book on stakeholder capitalism, but really sort of thinking about an entire new paradigm for the way we do business. Uh, no pun intended. Um, or maybe I should say pun intended there. We've seen parallel initiatives here in the United States in the United States with, for example, the Markle Foundation's Rework America Task Force, a coalition of, of companies really trying to walk the walk on improving job quality and thinking about the future of work in a way that tilts the balance back where workers and employers are working together to shape the future. There have been similar efforts at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation to really move the needle on job quality. And we've seen movement from the policy space as well. Um, in our conversation with Jed, we referenced the uh, good jobs principles that the Commerce Department and the Labor Department uh, published last year and then followed up with a toolkit to help small and medium-sized employers in particular uh, improve the quality of the jobs that, they're, uh, that they have to offer, the wage markers, but also the non-wage markers, the kinds of things that our speakers were referencing today, the flexibility, the stability, benefits, paid leave, caregiving, support. Um, so I'm hopeful, Kevin, I'm hopeful that we'll get employers to step up and engage in, in shaping a better future of work uh, in a way that centers and respects the workers that make up some of these companies. But we need a lot more work in the future. And um, that's been my personal motivation to, to sort of uh, broker our partnership with the World Economic Forum around uh, how workplace tech make jobs better instead of worse, uh, how we can reach the ideals that we've, we've been discussing today. So um, those are a couple of observations that, that we've seen in the Center on Education and Labor, just sort of studying this space. But um, I'm going to be very excited to follow uh, the job quality movement in particular uh, in relation to employer action. There was one final um, development that I wanted to share out there. Um, the Burning Glass Institute partnered with the Project on the Workforce at Harvard University to produce 
the American Opportunity Index uh, for the very first time, a, a index that allowed us to study which employers were uh, being successful in worker mobility and which ones were not. And uh, this project was coincidentally supported by the Schultz Foundation and our venerable former colleague, uh, Tyra uh, Mariani uh, there. So I look to developments like the American Opportunity Index, the Rework America Task Force, the Good Work Framework from the World Economic Forum and policy movements, but we need incentives to uh, 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 spur action. We can't just rely on uh, a core group of high road employers to help us along here. So those are some thoughts. Great. Thank you both. Thank you so much, Thank Kevin. You. And now we'll be turning to our audience Q&A. And uh, gosh, so many questions have come in. Uh, Anne-Marie, to start us off, I might read us a question and uh, um, turn to you for a response, and then we can, we can move from there. So the first question that we've received is um, from Alex. Thank you, Alex. And it's about ideas to counter human obsolescence, as in um, how demand for labor can be uh, increased as all of the developments that we've been talking about today continue to permeate. Anne-Marie, what, what do you think we need to be thinking about to really center this, this human role in work uh, more visibly and more concretely uh, as we talk about shaping the future of work? What comes to mind for you? I think I should start by saying I am not worried about human obsolescence. Uh, I do think it's something we need to think about. Uh, and indeed, uh, Danielle Allen talked about, you know, human comp technology that is complementary to humans rather than replacing of humans. Absolutely. Uh, but what I see is that even with something like chat GPT, the, you know, chat GPT is going to be able to code or is able to, we will have AIs that can code, uh, they can, that can distill, that can gather. Uh, those are all the kinds of tasks that are um, less creative. They require tremendous analytical intelligence, but not emotional intelligence. So what I see is that humans will still, for the foreseeable future, have lots of things that they can do that uh, machines can do a little of. I mean, there there are automated pets in Japan that that seniors can engage with. And we all saw the movie, or many of us saw the movie Her. So I'm not saying you can engage with something that is not human. You can, uh, but I see a whole new world of jobs that are about investing in human flourishing opening up. Uh, so, and again, Klaus Schwab wrote about talentism now five years ago uh, it, it, as saying that that was going to be the future rather than capitalism would be investing in human talent. I don't think of it in quite such economic terms. I think about it in terms of, of uh, again, with the aid of technology, enabling human beings to live up to their full potential. And believe me, given the inequalities in our country and in the world, we've got plenty of work to do there, uh, given the, the number of people who don't have that opportunity. Uh, the, so that's, that's one, one thing that sort of a, a kind of area of, of jobs that, that I, I think about a lot. And again, technology um, will help us. The other is, a lot of work that we do has just not been valued. So the the obvious part is care. You know, many of us work an eight hour day, a 10 hour day, a 12 hour day, go home, take care of whoever needs be being cared, cared for in your family or extended family. That was not, that's work. It just wasn't ever valued. And uh, uh, Danielle mentioned, you know, civic work, participation in your community, taking time out to answer that survey, to go to a town hall. Those are, you know, those are things that human beings do of value. They're not play. Let's put it that way. And so I see a, a world in which maybe we'll have six-hour workdays or four-hour work weeks or maybe even three and a half. 
uh, but we'll be doing lots of other kinds of human activity, again, whether we think of it as work or we think of it as valuable activity, uh, that, that, and th that the world uh, that we're entering will make it uh, fiscally possible for us to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think those are some uh, terrific reflections. And, um, you know, I, I'm just sort of struck by what Derek Thompson has written about in terms of workism and how uh, the connection between workism and spirituality even. And, yeah. you know, there was an Atlantic piece just a couple of weeks back that really sort of called for a resurgence in the spiritual movement globally uh, in light of what's happening with the future of work. So um, I think that's just, just fascinating. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, uh, our team at New America is also partnering with uh, the Center on the Future of Being Human at Arizona State University for a series of discussions, uh, sort of small meetings where we really think about what will it mean to be a human being in 100 years? If we didn't have to work, what would we do? Who would want us to do what and why? Really thinking about these, these you know, big picture questions in, in the traditional ASU ethos. <laughs> so thank you, Alex, for the question. Um, we have time for a couple of more questions, so I will turn on to the next one, Anne-Marie. Um, so the next question we have here is from Greg. Thank you, Greg. Um, how will higher education need to adapt given the findings of the SHIFT Commission, especially for older workers who need to reskill? Oh gosh, love this question. Um, Anne-Marie, to you first. Oh my, well, for the, uh, you know, I spent the first 20 years of my career uh, first as a law school professor and then a professor of public and international affairs. Uh, and, uh, you know, Shailen, you mentioned ASU and we have a partnership with ASU in part because uh, ASU is the new American university and we're new America, but also because they're innovating so much and so continually uh, in in education, uh, the, and they have a you know a complete uh, full immersion, partial immersion. They don't think of it as online and offline. They just think about all the different ways we can learn. I think we are in for an educational revolution that is certainly comparable to adding high school, which was sort of the marker between the the agricultural age and the industrial age, at least in the United States. Uh, and many other countries where we need it, we realize that eight years of just learning to read and write is not enough. Well, now we're going to um, realize that, as you said, that there's kind of got to be rolling learning. And lifelong learning, I don't think quite captures it because it's more, um, you know, you may be learning while you're on a job, you know, for the next job. You may also be learning in very different ways. I mean, Kevin Carey, the head of the, our education policy program, wrote a wonderful piece and it really has thought about what about education in the humanities? How many of us wish, you know, that we had we could have taken a course in art or music or literature of so many different kinds? And that that should not be restricted to some elite that gets to go to a liberal arts college. You know, human beings the world over respond to literature and music and art and many, many different kinds of craft. Even as I think about, you know, YouTube videos now and how my children, you know, they have a universal constant university. Uh, or So I, I don't think we can predict uh, except to say it'll get a lot cheaper. There will be, and we heard, um, I think it was Danielle all again, who said, and she's from Harvard, but talking about stackable credentials, many kinds of certificates. I think we like some structure. I don't think that just big, you know, internet courses where you do it for your own. No, it's more satisfying like a game to say, I'm going to learn this amount. I'm going to be certified in some way but we're just knocking on the door of an educational revolution. Absolutely. I, I think that's exactly spot on. And just drawing on some recent research from our own Center on Education and Labor, uh, we just released a series of reports on uh, how to get non-degree workforce education right at community colleges. And there's been so much work on affordability of community college level education and the importance of that, of, of 
renewing the promise of education and helping us reach the American dream and bringing that back to play. Um, so I think that's really terrific. And it's interesting you mentioned YouTube. I, I also read that Arizona State University has a new partnership with YouTube and Coursera in which many, many millions of just casual viewers who learn by looking things up on YouTube are able to now get course credit through this partnership with Arizona State University. Um, so truly a, a, a disruptive moment, but um, hopefully for the better. That means my younger son is going to be PhD qualified. <laughs> <laughs> so Doing the number of hours he spends, he has spent on YouTube. Absolutely. Yep. Dual enrollment uh, 2.0 here. Um, yep. Well, so our next question comes from Jennifer. So thank you, Jennifer. Um, so will the future of work also require deeper human relationships in certain industries like healthcare, for example, um, to address the growing challenges? And, and Jennifer cited mental health in particular, uh, human challenges needing a human touch. Um, gosh, this is, this is, I know, core to so much of what we do here. Anne-Marie, thoughts on, on the shifting nature of human relationships and work and um, what we should be thinking about? Yeah, and Shailen, you and I have talked about this quite a bit. Uh, as I define, as I think about care, uh, I think care, the essence of care is the relationship between the, the caregiver and the person who's cared for. So it's not a service. We classify it as a service because we have an, uh, our economic uh, measurements look at goods and services and how many of each are provided. But the service, you know, could be feeding, bathing, dressing, driving. There are many things that go into care. That's the platform for an interaction between two human beings. And it is the nature of that interaction that matters. I often use the example of when you're bathing a child. Yes, you're bathing the child. But what you're, you're really doing or what you should be doing if you're, you're giving good care is talking to that child about you know whether, whether you're asking questions, you're you're playing games, you're engaging uh, with, and that's true for any activity. That if we think about that more broadly, you can think of an entire relationship economy, and you think about all the coaches again building human potential. There's you can have a coach for anything. Now, uh, you know, health, nutrition, uh, work, leadership, you name it, uh, you can have a coach, you can have a mentor, you can have an advisor, you can have a navigator, obviously teachers. So I see a huge economy opening up that I would, it's based on the relationship between human beings. Care is, is the biggest example perhaps now, but only one. Uh, and there, I think, again, we haven't studied what makes that relationship really work. And we have from different disciplines, but not in the context of what that would look like as a source of value in an economy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I love the the term relationship economy. And it, it also brings me back to our, our prior question and sort of how we can operationalize this, this lifelong learning, but really more than that, really sort of how do we build a relationship economy around self-actualization in lieu of a lot of what we're, we would do normally in, in the years past? So I think that's really a, a great point. And the other thing that comes to mind for me with respect to mental health in particular, and, and this hasn't come up as much in our conversation, so I, I just wanted to name it in that... Um, Many of our mental health challenges are a result, a byproduct, an inadvertent byproduct, but a byproduct nonetheless of technology. Uh, some of that is at work. Uh, somebody had mentioned Slack and Zoom and Zoom fatigue and Slack fatigue and um, all of the, the pain points that arise there, but also with social media and, and other forms of consumption. The consumption economy has become very powerful. And, you know, just as we think about the promise of technology for work and, and play and, and self-actualization, um, I, I channel my uh, uh, ASU colleagues in thinking about the risks and how to mitigate those unintended risks of uh, technology at play as well. So, so that comes to mind for me as well here. 
So our next question uh, comes from Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and this is also really tied to, to uh, education, Anne-Marie. So how should secondary education, in particular uh, career and technical education, change given how technology has evolved over the past two, three years? So that's really interesting sort of thinking about, you know, tech within the workforce development ecosystem, community colleges and the like, um, and uh, skilled trades training, the apprenticeship infrastructure, all of the uh, workforce development programs we have to equip folks with the skills they need for these sort of middle skill, uh, skilled technical workforce jobs. Um, Henry, what comes to mind for you there? So I'm going to toss that one to you first, Shailen. You know much more about that than I do. Uh, so I'm going to have you answer and I will come in. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think this is a really fascinating question. I, 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 think, I think tech in higher education has gotten a well-deserved but a bad rep. Uh, we've seen MOOCs. We've seen a number of hype cycles with um, uh, online education, and I think a number of observers and analysts and researchers are very skeptical about technology in the classroom, and especially when it comes to uh, the career technical education space, where a number of these programs are shorter, more directly tied to discrete employer needs. Um, I actually see that there's been a little bit of a lag of thinking about how technology can de be deployed to improve the quality of education and workforce training and CTE, and also thinking about outcomes. There's two examples that come to mind for me in particular. The first is the actual technological infrastructure of our community colleges to be able to do things like read labor market information, the data that we have available about jobs and about skills that are in demand and use that to inform program design uh, at the CT level and also the infrastructure at community colleges to see what happens to their graduates thereafter. Many colleges lack the infrastructure to do that and it's not at the fault of the colleges. We haven't designed in that way as a country. Um, so, you know, there's limited infrastructure to track outcomes data, whether it's through unemployment record, uh, wage record matches and, you um, sort of thinking about uh, how that connects to student records and tracking salary and outcomes. But then there's actually the delivery of education and some of these CT programs themselves. And one thing that comes to mind for me is thinking about how AR and VR has been really uh, promoted as a tool to train uh, in the skilled trades, uh, specifically the firefighter and um, sort of the safety professional space. I know that has been an important use case to use tech to improve the quality of CT education at the community college level, but even outside of the community college uh, apparatus as well. So those are two things that come to mind for me, the data utilization of our community colleges and the use of technology as an augmenting tool of educators in our CT and community college ecosystem. Um, other thoughts there, Anne-Marie? No, uh, so I would, I would actually add, I, I do, th I think you're right. I think there are many ways uh, to to use tech better. And I just think about, you know, pilots. If you think about, you know, a pilot, a civil, civil civilian pilot, or certainly a military pilot, they spend hours in simulators, right? They don't go out there until they've anticipated what's going to happen. And certainly when you think about firefighters, but you think about almost anyone kind of, again, doing it is and do really thinking that you are doing it and then doing it is so important. I also though think we need a real attitude change toward working with our hands rather than our heads. Human beings are evolved to do both, just as we're evolved to walk. And we often, our brains work better when we're actually walking for all sorts of reasons. But lots of philosophers have written on craft and the importance of craft. And you think about, um, you, you know, you think about building. I'm always, I always say if there were, you know, some kind of 
huge catastrophe and civilization were nearly wiped out, it would take a century before anybody would need a law professor, probably 10 centuries. That's what I was. But, you know, building a house, <laughs> cooking food, you know, any of those making clothes. And so I, I really think that that we need to understand that it is not it's not blue collar, white collar. It's not head versus hand. So often being able to work with your hands uh, means you have a different way of thinking about things uh, and it makes your brain work in all sorts of great ways. Uh, and similarly, you know, people who spend all their time thinking with their heads would really do well <laughs> you know, to, to be. And probably many of us might well choose if it were possible to actually learn uh, physical craft in various ways. So I, I do think there there's an at attitudinal shift. Maybe it will be helped if those jobs have more tech in them. But I hope that that's not what's required. Absolutely. Absolutely. Gosh, well, what a terrific conversation this has been. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, uh, would hope that all in the audience uh, continue to engage with us, sign up for our newsletters, tweet us, uh, write us, share your thoughts. Um, and Marie, to close out, any final thoughts from you on, on as we reflect on the Shift Commission anniversary? Well, I want to start again uh, by, you know, sending our warmest thoughts to Roy, uh, and he he was here, his spirit was here and, and his videos, and I know he really did want uh, to be here, but he, he did what I believe is the right thing to do. He put families and friends first. Uh, also, again, a uh, shout out to Kristen Sharp, who really did lead the Shift Commission uh, and was very important to making it happen. And a huge thank you uh, to Bethany and Pamela. Uh, I was fascinated taking notes uh, fast as you were writing, as you were talking. Uh, and iGen and Danielle uh, and Jed. Uh, and Derek uh, really was a fabulous conversation. And, and to Kevin, you as well. Uh, you know, I think the, the, what I think of maybe in closing is the shift commission was a great thing to do to try to imagine alternative futures. We were, we knew that you do that with a dose of humility. We even so didn't come close to imagining the pandemic. So I, I think, I, I would leave us with here too, we should be grappling with what the limits of our imagination and, and Bethany and Pamela, you said, you know, we can reimagine the whole system, but if the shift commission is shift commission teaches us anything, it's that in 2028, we'll be looking back thinking, God, we could have never imagined that. So with that, uh, thanks and thanks, Shailen, to you and to Mary Alice uh, and to all of the New America team that made this possible. Uh, and it's been a pleasure uh, having this conversation and we're grateful to all of you who are participating and watching online. Thanks so much, Henry, and thank you all for joining. It's been a terrific conversation.